it's Thursday the 6th of May and the time's 11am uh, here in the UK so welcome to today's Marine Biology Live. Marine Biology Live is a series of monthly talks and conversations where we invite members of the marine biological community uh, to share the work that they've been doing to explore and un understand and sustainably interact with the ocean and its inhabitants. I'm Jack Sill. Um, I'm going to be joined today uh, by three wonderful speakers um, who are all very, very active in the world of marine citizen science. Um, we're going to be hearing shortly from Susan Hewitt uh, about the iNaturalist platform um, and Jules Agate about the big seaweed search. Um, but first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Charlotte Bolton. Hello, everybody. <laughs> OK, hi. Um, so Charlotte is the National sea, sea Search Coordinator for the Marine Conservation Society. Um, she's a keen diver and snorkeler, and she began her sea search journey as a volunteer, uh, recording her sightings um, when she was diving. Um, from there, she became the regional, regional coordinator for Dorset in 2012, and she's been national coordinator since 2016. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you to Jack for the introduction and thanks to the MBA for the, intro the, uh, the invitation to speak to you all today. I say, my name's Charlotte Bolton. I live on, um, on Portland in Dorset. Uh, I work for the Marine Conservation Society as the National Sea Search Coordinator. And my talk today is going to tell you all about the Sea Search project, recording the marine life around our shores. And now, there we go. Sea Search has been running for over 30 years now. We've got a network of coordinators and volunteers basically everywhere, all around Britain and Ireland, the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man. Our core activity has always been scuba diving, but in the last couple of years, we've been actively encouraging snorkelers to take part. And obviously last year with all the COVID restrictions, um, we couldn't do much diving. Uh, and a lot of our volunteers also kept themselves busy with intertidal surveys, uh, keeping the information rolling in and keeping themselves engaged with what's going on on, on the shores. So Sea Search is primarily about teaching people to recognise and record what they see underwater. Hundreds of thousands of dives are made every year around our shores, and that's a massive resource that we can use to collect information. When we asked our volunteers about their involvement with Sea Search, why did they get involved in the first place? Why did they stay involved? They highlighted that they wanted to learn more about what they saw underwater. And they also wanted to put their hobby to good use, collecting data and having that being used for marine conservation. So you don't, work, don't need to be an expert to start off with. You do not need to be a marine biologist because we provide all the training that you need to get involved with Sea Search. There's a one day entry level observer course. Uh, that's the, the, the start of the training. And that leads on then to the higher level surveyor training. We also run specialist courses in identification of various groups of marine life and also techniques such as underwater photography. And we've published a series of marine life ID guides to help you recognize what you see on your dives and snorkels. So the primary aim of the Sea Search project is to collect data. We record both the species and the broader context that those species occur in. So the whole biological community, the whole habitat, everything that we see underwater. All of our records go onto the National Biodiversity Network Atlas, where they're freely available for anyone to browse or use with certain restrictions about sensitive species. So you could see your name in lights on the NBN. Uh, we also organise surveys to fill in gaps where we don't have much information uh, and dive clubs are very much encouraged and supported to organise independent sea search expeditions, maybe to adopt a particular site that they dive frequently or again to, to go somewhere where we don't have any data and to fill in the gaps. And here's Wendy, the North West England coordinator off Blackpool Pleasure Beach. You can imagine Liverpool Bay and Morecambe Bay. We don't have a lot of data from there. And of course, we always try and provide cake because that's very important. So we record species and habitats. One of the things that we've been looking at, particularly down here in the southwest of England in the last few years, is a priority species known as the crawfish or the spiny lobster. So since 2015, we've been seeing on the dives down in Cornwall, Devon and, and now into Dorset, many, many more of these animals appearing uh, on our dives. And we've been recording that, that in, um, increase in the population. 
Uh, another thing that sea search volunteers had spotted arriving on the south coast of, of England, first spotted under Swanage Pier in 2007 by sea search volunteers, is this funky little shrimp known as the snake locks anemone shrimp or prawn. Um, and that's more generally a Mediterranean species. And as the waters warm up, these, these animals are appearing on the south coast um, and you could be the first to spot one. So that's something that we're monitoring the arrival of those new species. Another thing that we that we encourage are encouraging people to record are the, the common species, you know, the things that you might see on every dive. Um, and one of those one of those areas is that is the uh, the wrasse population again down here in the southwest of England. Here is a beautiful male cuckoo wrasse. There is a live wrasse fishery for these animals where the fish are taken and used as cleaner fish in salmon farms and without collecting those sightings and those those records we don't know whether that is possibly having an effect on the wild population so that's something that we're encouraging people to record um, another once common species but no longer so sadly is the native oyster seen here very well disguised you can just see the gap between the two halves of the shell here um, this is on a, a reef in Pool Bay in Dorset. Now the native oyster is, is an animal that used to form you know, massive beds on the south coast. It has declined. There are projects looking at reintroducing it. And again, we want our volunteers to tell us where they see these animals. So we, we've got the data and the information that we can use for monitoring and making sure that those fisheries are, are regulated and are sustainable. So here is a, a possibly familiar site. There's been a lot of information um, and publicity about seagrass in the news lately. Uh, again, a priority habitat, a very important habitat, uh, a nursery for juvenile fish, providing coastal protection against storms as the, as the weather gets increasingly stormy. Um, and as a plant, uh, it's, it photosynthesizes. So it stores carbon, it takes, takes carbon from the atmosphere and stores it even more efficiently than the rainforest. So a really important habitat and one that we, we want to know where it is, we want to know what condition it's in, and we want to look at protecting it. Also important and, and something that you might not have realized was a seaweed because it doesn't look very seaweedy, is this chalky pink stuff. Not, not the, don't get distracted by the, the hermit crab in the middle. I know Jack will be looking at the crab. Um, the pink stuff around it is a coralline algae called merle. And again, it's a, it's a carbon store because it's a seaweed and it's also very fragile. So both seagrass and merle are, are habitats that can be damaged by human activities, fishing, dredging, etc. So both of these habitats, the seagrass and the merle, are providing a focus for a big project that's currently underway along the south coast of England, and that's Life Recreation Remedies. It's led by Natural England, and these are the other the partners involved in it. And from the Marine Conservation Society point of view, Sea Search, that's us, we're collecting the data, and Jules is going to talk in the next talk about the Sea Champions network of volunteers um, the big seaweed search, beach watch, wildlife sightings, these are all ways in which as a volunteer you can, you can interact with the Marine Conservation Society and do your bit to provide that information. And obviously we have a, a strong education arm and, and we work on influencing policy as well at the MCS. Oh, oh too, too fast. So the Remedies Project is, is on the south coast of England. It's, it's focusing on um, five special areas of conservation um, from the Isles of Scilly down in the far southwest, the Fal and Helford in Cornwall, Plymouth Sound and Estuaries on the Devon and Cornwall border, Solent Maritime in Hampshire and Essex Estuaries over on, on the east coast. So what Sea Search is doing, we're using volunteers, we're going diving, snorkeling, and particularly in Essex, using small boats, kayaks, etc., to go and look for seagrass and for merle and to and to monitor um, the actions of this project to see if they're actually working. So we're checking out old records, we're looking in places where seagrass or merle might be found to go and to go and see if it is there. So collecting all that baseline information. And just generally collecting as much information as we can with our volunteers and that's where you can help. 
So this week already, Matt Slater down in Cornwall, he works for the Cornwall Wild, Wildlife Trust and he's the Sea Search Cornwall uh, coordinator. He's already organised a shore dive on the Helford River, going to check out the seagrass beds, which you see in this picture looking very healthy and lovely there. Um, and over in Essex, Sea Search East, Dawn Watson and Rob Spray have been braving the mud and sacrificing their wellies to uh, to see what they can find there um, and in fact they're finding that the historical records of seagrass it's no longer there so that's an important finding uh, another project involving sea search this time in partnership with the mba is the ambitious darwin tree of life project which is aiming to look at the dna sequence of 70,000 plants and animals in britain and ireland i think this is this is great i love the ambition we're going to sequence everything all of these 70,000 species it's fabulous we're involved on the marine side obviously with the mba um, and that DNA work is transforming what we know about species and their identification. So here's a recent example, a nudibranch, a sea slug, which we'd always been calling Polycera quadrilineata. And now it turns out that the one with the black speckles shown here is a different species, Polycera norvegica. So it's all very exciting. The potential to form a mass reprinting of all our guides as the names change, but exciting times. So if you'd like to find out more about how you can get involved, drop us an email at the uh, address shown there. And there's our Twitter account. If you're on that platform, you can follow us. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very Thanks, much. Everyone. Stella. Up next, um, we have Jules. Jules, uh, uh, as I may mention, works for the Marine Conservation Society um, and she's the Sea Champions Volunteer and Community Engagement Manager for the southwest of England region. Um, she coordinates a number of citizen science activities um, and I think she's been most, to most of our annual bio blitzes as well. Um, <laughs> in particular, Jules uh, works on um, the Citizen Science Initiative, the Big Seaweed Search, um, which is a, a project partnership project with the um, Natural History Museum. Okay, so hi everyone. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the big seaweed search, as Jack said. Um, I've got a long and boring title, which he valiantly tried to <laughs> say. Um, but essentially, I facilitate a team of amazing volunteers uh, called Sea Champions across seven counties in southwest England. And with them, I deliver outreach events, education sessions, campaign actions, beach cleans and citizen science projects. So I'm going to talk about the Big Sea Research, which is one of the projects that uh, myself and my volunteers are heavily involved in. And as Jack said, it's a partnership with the Natural History Museum. So it was started in 2009 by a professor, Juliet Brody of the Natural History Museum. So her idea was for it to be like Big Garden Birdwatch, but for seaweed. And the aim was to utilise our UK macroalgae as indicators of change occurring in our seas, primarily climate change, uh, through citizen science, scientists gathered data. So seaweeds are ideal monitoring subjects uh, for the intertidal and shallow marine environment. They're widely distributed, they can be accessed from the shore, so it's cheaper than diving, sorry Charlotte, uh, and they don't swim away. Um, and input into project development came from lots of stakeholders, the MBA, and we were involved as MCS. And then we came on board as partners in 2016 to try and help um, get it out there more widely to people actually taking part on the shore. So I won't dwell too much on the importance of seaweeds, as um, I'm sure most of you know. Um, but we do have somewhere around 7% of the world's species here in the UK, maybe over 650, um, it's changing all the time. And it's a hot spot, especially for large brown seaweeds, the kelp and the rat. And because there's increasing pressures on the marine environment, um, there's a need to monitor seaweeds for their own sake, as well as indicators of change. So it's been predicted for quite a long while that warming seas will cause a retraction of um, northwards of species that like cooler water, like our uh, beautiful kelps and the racks that we're also familiar with, the brown stuff on the shore in the British Isles. This shows the distribution of orweed, laminaria digitata, 
Um, it's northern boreal species, almost at the southern end of its range here. And um, despite its amazing uh, ecosystem services and all the protection it provides um, to our shores, um, there's potential of it retreating northwards, being lost, particularly from some of our southern and western coasts. And that could also have um, knock on effects on other species and on us, of course. And um, so they're particularly sensitive um, to change in sea temperature. And uh, Alaria escalenta is um, Jabalox, and uh, Marklin monitoring by the NBA has shown that this is also decreasing in abundance in the south and west of Britain. So its range is retracting, it seems to be um, going northwards. And, and like Laminaria digitata, it likes cool the water, and, but it's easier to identify in theory. You can see, it, although it's a kelp, it has this lovely midrib and then these uh, finger-like projections at the base. So we should be able to identify it. So although ocean temperature has risen on average by two degrees C in the last 40 years across the UK waters, um, that change isn't even across all areas. And we've seen non-native species, including Sargassum muticum or wireweed, Andaria pinnatifida or wakami, and others increasingly colonised our shores. But again, it's not even around the whole of the British Isles. And we know that greenhouse gas emissions are rising, leading to more CO2, leading to increased acidification of seawater, and potentially some of our classified seaweeds like mill and could be affected by the corrosiveness of um, a higher pH. But again, we don't know uh, to what degree and in what locality. So we need more data with abundance information from around the coast. Um, seaweeds have been relatively poorly recorded, particularly in terms of having any abundance data. Um, so to pick up these changes at the scale we need, um, we want to get more people out there. So the big theory search tries to look at those three questions, what's happening with um, in regards to sea surface temperature rise, non-native species and ocean acidification through citizen science data. So the idea is relatively simple. Anyone can take part, anyone anywhere in the UK at any time of year. Uh, spot the person who's about to fall over here, one of my volunteers, Kaylee, <laughs> took a tumble just after this. Uh, so I'm going to do that classic thing of putting up a slide with loads of info on it and then not saying all that info. <laughs> so our aims for the big C research are not just to gather data, um, but also to engage with a broad audience, introduce marine environments to them and, and share an understanding of how they might be changing. Raising awareness is a key aim. We want people to see seaweed not just as brown, smelly, slimy stuff that's a nuke. We want to highlight the role that a wide range of people can have in science and conservation, how it can be enjoyable and easy. And of course, we want to increase awareness of our respective organisations, but really just also that charities and NGOs uh, contribute to knowledge as well as uh, campaigning and all the other things that we do. So how are we doing this? We're using 14 types of seaweed to try and answer the three questions. Uh, one to eight are species we expect to respond to uh, increased sea surface temperature. These are two kelps, five rats and thongweed. And these are some of our most productive and common brown seaweeds are often highly under recorded, especially when it comes to abundance. Um, and you can't understand change if you don't know how much is there, um, as well as just presence. So nine to 12 uh, are non-native species, Sargassum muticum or wireweed, Andaria pinnatifida or wakami, Asparagopsis armata, harpoonweed, and Bonimasonia homifera, Bonimasonia spitweed. And all of these get identified species level, and they should be identifiable, although, as we'll see, that's not always the case. And I'm laughing just because, you know, I, I misidentify things sometimes too. We also include two groups of calcified red, red algae, the calcified crust and coral weed, but not to species level to make it achievable because 
but they're difficult and there's lots of them. Um, but they have the potential to be corroded during increased um, ocean acidification and warming seas make it harder for them to lay down calcium carbonate in the first place, so they're likely to show declines. So it's designed uh, for the survey to be suitable as a group activity or in pairs, not alone, of course. <laughs> And running it with youth groups, we hope um, to act as a springboard to engage with people so that they grow up with seaweed and don't just see it as brown stuff to hit your small brother with, um, and also with scientific questions and methods. So we've completed a couple of projects um, engaging with children and young people too. And we offer training to our Sea Champions volunteers uh, to students, to groups, some of whom have gone on to do their own surveys and to train others. And this has been face to face up to last March, um, but we're piloting an online session in June. Uh, we'd really like to, if you'll offer it to people who are um, happy to train other people, you don't need to be an expert, I'm definitely not, and um, to show people how to do the survey. Um, it's, it's easy and it's relatively fun. Um, if you're an individual, um, we want to be offering some sessions to MBA members, so look out for that um, in the newsletter. Or you can drop me a line if you're interested. So what have we found? Well, we wouldn't have found anything out really without Seaweed Sally, who's been our amazing uh, Plymouth University placement student. She's worked all summer looking at four years of data, uh, mainly on her kitchen table, so massive thanks to her. And what she's found is that between 2016 to 2020, so not the whole of her, the survey, um, we had 378 surveys completed after removing duplicates and incompletes and things we didn't know what was going on. Uh, 1,414 participants completed 361 hours and the average survey time was just 0.57 hours, so just over half an hour and we expected it to be about an hour. It all, it all obviously varies with the complexity of the shore you're looking at. Here's a map of all the surveys completed uh, 2016 to 2020, it's quite a good spread around the UK. There's gaps over there on the east coast where there's not a lot of rocky shore, uh, but you can do the survey on artificial structures like piers and groins. Uh, so we're going to be promoting that to try and fill the gaps. We've also got some gaps up there in the northwest um, and parts of Scotland as well. So we really want to plug some of these gaps and get more people involved. Uh, there's a total of 1,007 records once we've done all the verification and the scale of the circles here represents a proportion of records per species and the racks are well represented as expected. And most commonly recorded and identified was serrated racks followed by blaz racks and the least uh, recorded correctly were bonimace and sickweed and were farming. Um, and we've produced distribution maps, but I'm not going to show those here because it's just too long. So the overall proportion of records that were correctly identified was 54% and the species with the highest proportion was uh, Buca serrata, serrated rat. <laughs> but that means 46% were rejected, uh, that's 869 records. Um, Quite a lot of them had no photo, but we don't know whether that was because people didn't take one or our website crashed as they were trying to upload it. So we've had to make improvements there. Um, and 73% had photos and of those uh, they were rejected either because it was misidentified, they, the seaweeds were unattached, so they weren't growing, we didn't know where they'd come from, um, or there were other photo problems, uh, like they were blurry. And it's not surprising really because uh, seaweeds can look different when they're growing on different shores. This, these are all Fucus fasciculosis. Um, they can have different um, growth forms at different times of their reproductive cycle. Um, so we've improved a lot of our guides to try and help with this. And there's a really useful picture guide there, which I'll put the link to uh, in the chat afterwards. 
So it says what's next, but we've actually updated the website. We've created some videos about why the survey is important and how to do it. And we're supporting a dedicated group of volunteers to act as surveyors. We're offering this increased targeted training and we want to make partnerships to broaden uptake and promote a big seaweed search week because we really need to just make it bigger really so that we can get the data that we need to try and answer these um, questions in the longer term. Uh, the data we do have is pretty good. It's all geo-referenced, so um, it's been used to um, do a red list assessment for British um, seaweed um, this year. So the important bit of how to do it. Well, everything you need is on our website, www.bigseaweedsearch.org. Um, another website will be mentioned in this video, but it is this one. <laughs> We've updated everything. And on there, you can find a guide, um, a form, um, and that's where you upload your data as well, which is always the tricky bit, getting people to do that. So I'm just going to show you a video of how to do it. So let's hope this works. There are six key steps to the Big Seaweed Search Survey. Step one, select your survey area. Now the survey area needs to be a five metre wide plot that runs from the top of the shore down to the sea. Use a couple of landmarks to mark out your survey area. So they could be natural landmarks or they could be a couple of things you brought with you. I brought a couple of buckets to mark out the area. Make sure you've checked the tide tables and make sure that you're doing the big seaweed search survey on a low tide. Step two of your survey, fill in section one of your recording form. Step three, starting at the bottom of the shore, closest to the sea and with your back to the sea, take a photo of your plot. So step four of the survey, walk away from the sea, carefully exploring the entire area of your survey plot. When you find one of the seaweeds in the Big Seaweed Search leaflet, you should tick it off on your recording form, take a clear photo showing the identification features of that seaweed and show that the seaweed is attached and growing. You can upload up to three photos per species. Also record its abundance. So you can do this as band forming, with bands of seaweed across your plot. It could be patchy, where there are several patches of seaweed across your plot. Or it could be sparse, where there is only one or two patches of seaweed. If you later find a bigger patch of seaweed, update your recording form. Really importantly, only record and photograph living seaweeds like these ones, not dead ones washed upon the beach. This is because dead seaweeds or unattached seaweeds may have come from a completely different part of the shoreline and they won't accurately show what seaweeds you have on your stretch. These are living seaweeds and you can tell they are attached by gently tugging them just to see whether they are stuck or anchored onto the rocks. Step five, tick the absent box on the recording form for any seaweeds that you didn't find on your plot. Step six, the last step, the really important bit. Enter your results and upload your photos at www.nhm.ac.uk forward slash seaweeds. And I'll stop that there because that was the wrong address. <laughs> so the right address is www.bigseaweedsearch.org.uk. And we're promoting a seaweed week um, 2nd to, to the 8th of August 2021. So I'll stop there and we can come back to um, talk about anything else in, in the questions. OK, thanks very much, Jules. That's a fantastic talk. I would like to, uh, to welcome Susan Hewitt. Um, who's going to be talking to us about the iNaturalist platform. Um, Susan has numerous affiliations, including uh, the American Museum of Natural History, Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum, uh, Randall's uh, Island Park Alliance, Carl Schertz um, Park Conservancy, <clears throat> and New York Botanical Garden. Um, she's a lifelong naturalist with 56 publications, mostly on marine mollusks. 
Um, on iNaturalist, she's a power user, and I'm sure she'll explain what that means for those of you who don't already know. Um, and she's number one on the leaderboards of numerous projects. Susan lives uh, on the island of Manhattan in New York, um, but today she's joining us from the island of Sanibel. I'm told that it's so early that the sun hasn't yet risen where you are, Susan. So thank you very, very much for joining us so early. Hello. My name is Susan Hewitt, as Jack said, and I'm currently in Southwest Florida. I'm speaking to you from Southwest Florida. I'm going to talk to you today about iNaturalist. To confirm that you're in good hands, let me explain that so far I've made more than 83,000 observations of my own on iNat, plus more than 107,000 identifications of other people's observations. Thanks to INAT, these observations and identifications are available to researchers, scientists, and citizen scientists all around the world. I was an avid naturalist long before 2008 when INAT started up. As a toddler, I remember picking up as many species of seashells as I could find when I was on vacation on the coast of Devon. As an adult starting in 1970, I have written and published 56 papers about the natural world, mostly on mollusks and most published in peer reviewed journals. On iNaturalist, which I joined in 2014, I'm on the number one position on the leaderboards of numerous projects I hope you can agree that I'm a good guide to INAT and the ways it can help you day by day. iNaturalist isn't the only online database you can use, so you might ask what's so special about it. I can answer that in a few words, comprehensiveness and ease of use. The point is whatever you want iNaturalist to do, it's designed to be simple to use and intuitive as well as being visually attractive. You don't have to be any kind of expert to use INAT successfully. Yesterday I was relaxing in an outdoor chair when I noticed an interesting beetle settled next to me. I clicked two buttons on my smartphone and in less than 10 seconds, an observation was on its way to the iNaturalist website. I knew the ID of this beetle. It was a dark flower scarab, Euphoria sepulcralis. But if I didn't know the ID, iNaturalist has what we call computer vision. That's an AI setup that's getting better and better at making identifications as it's fed more and more reliable data. iNat also has many human professional experts, as well as numerous amateurs who have expertise in one taxon or one geographical area. Many of those INAT people spend a lot of time helping identify observations made by other people. So now anyone anywhere can see the beetle that I saw yesterday. They can learn what I thought, thought it was and they can comment on it or suggest another ID. You can even connect with the person who made the observation in this case, me. Note that you don't need to know what something is in order to make an observation of it. You don't necessarily even need to know which phylum it belongs to. Although if you do have some idea, please put that information in like bird, plant, fungus. INAT prefers that you concentrate on wild organisms although recording a few observations of captive animals or cultivated plants or even of humans is not really a problem. Also, if you get an ID wrong, it does not matter much as eventually it will be corrected by someone else or several other people. The observation, once it's been uploaded to the website, has its own URL. And so you can send that link to anyone who can give some useful feedback, whether or not that person is also an INATO. 
do you want to learn more about that beetle species, the family it belongs to, or even the order Coleoptera? Naturalist has a taxon page for every taxon currently in the database, a page which gives you information of all kinds, icon images, a distribution map, a full taxonomy, a graph showing you when the species have been most observed, and so on. The taxon page also lists the person who has made the most observations of that taxon and the person who has made the most identifications of that taxon. And you can ask those people questions if you like. So what do you yourself need to open up this world of INAT? You need curiosity about the natural world, of course, but you wouldn't be here unless you already have that. You download the free iNaturalist app and create a screen name and password. Then I would suggest that you start on iNaturalist by making some easy observations of weeds by the pathway or insects near or in your home in order to get the hang of things. A smartphone which includes a decent camera along with a cheap clip-on macro lens is good equipment. Your phone is a rapid way to make observations, <clears throat> but you can instead take photographs with any camera and upload them to INAT later in the day. The app creates a dot on a map and a time and a date. But if it's more interesting to you to start by making some identifications, you can do that. <clears throat> Okay, let me just take you through the process of making an observation. Here's my smartphone. And here, here is a seashell from this beach, the beach you see behind me on Sanibel. So I've got iNaturalist open. I hit the camera icon. I take a picture of this of the seashell. <clears throat> if I feel it looks good, I hit use photo. I'm not going to put an identification in. That's okay. If I think it the photo is good enough, I just hit save. And when I do that, then I have the chance to upload the image to the website. So I just do that. I hit upload. So <clears throat> on iNaturalist, each observation gets its own web page. If someone else agrees with my identification, <clears throat> they can confirm it. And then the observation achieves what iNaturalist calls research grade. <clears throat> and the data is sent to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. I mentioned a beetle, but let's get back to my first love, seashells, marine mollusks. Okay, here on my screen sharing, you can see <clears throat> what on iNaturalist we call my dashboard or home or sometimes feed. I've set it to show only my observations and these are observations where somebody else has either put in an identification or a comment and some of them are things that are near the beach and then here you'll start to see a whole lot of different seashells that were washed up on the beach. Sanibel is famous for its seashells so, and at the top, this is my home page, my feed, or my dashboard, it's called all of those things. And along the top here, there are links to a lot of different other features in iNaturalist. The profile, you can add as much or as little information to your profile page as you want to. INAT also gives you some statistics here about what you've seen. Um, just bring this down a bit. 
and then observations that's that's a just a list of all the recent most recent observations that i've made most of these are from yesterday afternoon and then Okay, let me just take you back. Okay, edit observations. This is very useful if you want to do a search or if you want to add a bunch of observations to a project. Calendar can sometimes be useful. That shows you which days you made observations and gives you some indication of how many. Okay, and then IDs shows you the recent identifications you've been making for other people. These are their images and these are your identifications. Okay, and then lists. iNaturalist automatically generates a couple of lists, a couple of different kinds of lists for you. And then at the end, we have journal. Journal, it can be useful to write short pieces on various topics. And your journal entries go out automatically to everyone on iNaturalist who has chosen to follow you. In my case, that's over 750 people. Okay. And, oh yes, a couple more headings. Favorites is a, a visual patchwork of all of the observations that you particularly like or ones that you wish to be able to find again. And then projects as favorites. Projects is a list of all of the projects that you belong to. Projects are groups of observations that have been assembled for a particular purpose. Okay, now perhaps I can talk a little bit about one piece of re research that INAT has enabled me to accomplish. Last month, I published a paper listing 51 species that were new to the list of marine mollusk species of the small Dutch Caribbean island of Sabre. The list of new ones includes 20 shellless gastropod species, including quite a lot of nudibranchs. And this was a valuable contribution to the knowledge of the marine fauna corner of the island and that part of the West Indies. Now, how many trips did I make to Sabre? None. I did all this research remotely thanks to INAT photo observations made by an INATer who is a scuba diver and underwater photographer. Instead of my trying to pick up shells from beach drift, note that there are no beaches on the steep rocky island of Sabre. I was instead able to pick out and gather together photo observations of these marine mollusk species, all thanks to my naturalists. My screen name is Susan Hewitt, one word. You can ping me by adding at to the front of my screen name in a comment on any observation. Of course, a 10 minute talk can only cover a few obvious INAT features. There's a lot to INAT, enough to satisfy not just the naturalist and citizen scientists, but also professional scientists who want data that is comprehensive and easy to work with. When you have a chance, take a look at some of the more advanced INAP features. So that's my story. If you're new to INAP, I hope that was a helpful introduction. If you've been wondering whether to shift to INAP or find that your institution has asked you to do that, I hope I've enabled you to see why it's a good choice and assured you that in time, you will come to love it as much as I do. So let me close now by wishing you happy eye-natting.
Thank you very much, Susan. You're okay. Um, I'll just uh, so if I can invite um, Jules and Charlotte to join us again, we'll just take a few questions. But while they're while they're arriving, um, I know yesterday um, when we were we were having a, a conversation, you mentioned that you were, um, and this this is for obvious reasons got my my <laughs> my attention. Um, you said you were currently doing a streak, um, and uh, it sounded from what you told me, it sounded like a really great idea. So I wanted to be quickly just tell tell people um, what that actually involves. Well, a streak <laughs> online naturalist is not taking your clothes off and running through town. What it is, is they're asking you if you want to do a streak, that means that every day you make one or more observations, no matter what. So my streak has been about a year and a half so far. And sometimes it is a bit difficult in the middle of winter in New York City and when it's very cold and when there's not much growing and no bugs out. But if I go out, I find something and that keeps my streak going. So that's, that's why when you looked at the calendar, every day had a little bit of a dark circle on it. That's because I've some observations every day. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I really like, like the idea. There's a challenge for everyone who's who's watching to to have a go at doing a doing a streak on a naturalist and uh, see how, see how long you can go for. Because I, yeah, I, I like that idea. It's good. It's a great way of kind of noticing things that you wouldn't notice otherwise. Um, I think absolutely uh, true. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, welcome back to Charlotte and Jules, and thank you all three of you for a brilliant set of talks. Uh, we've had a few questions that have come in. Firstly, um, obviously, you're all. Uh, very very passionate about the projects that you're involved in um and uh and you've been citizen scientist yourselves for, for quite some time so i was wondering if you could tell me really briefly um what first attracted you to doing citizen science um and then what was it that kind of kept you hooked for such a long time i think you know i think it was william Dahl who said that naturalists are born not made and I think I just had a natural instinct for wanting to find out stuff about nature. So I was starting to research without even knowing it was research. But as soon as I discovered that there were journals that weren't too terribly high power that maybe I could publish something in, then I wanted to write up something that was useful enough to get it published. So I naturalist, I was introduced to a number of years ago when somebody asked me to be the mollusk person in a bio blitz and I agreed to do that and I was told okay you have to sign up for INAT and then I found that it was a perfect fit for me so from then on I was in INAT all the time. <laughs> I think I started being a citizen scientist when I was about five <laughs> and going just beach combing on the shore with my dad and um, my dad was a painter and decorator, he wasn't a scientist. So we used to go home and get out the books, there was books in those days, no internet, and, and just find out what we'd found. And so that, I think that was how I started. I just would say that at one point I became an expert in something, it wasn't seaweed. And um, actually that was the most boring citizen science. <laughs> I think it's really fun when you're you're learning stuff and and for me that's the really great bit about doing citizen scientist jack as you know when i'm out on the shore with you i'm going what's that what's that <laughs> and it's um yeah that's the bit i love about it is finding out new stuff and not being an expert um, mm. and just learning as you go okay how about you shut um, well i i grew up right in the middle of england about as far from the coast as you can as you can get and, and I was one of these children that always had treasures. I was always poking around. I was always, you know, 300 yards behind on the walk, being shouted at to hurry up because I'd been distracted. I love the quote you had on your INAP um, profile, Susan. Just like you, you can't go anywhere quickly because you just get distracted by something. Um, and I, I actually learned to dive quite late. I didn't learn until 2002. And I was always the person that came back to the dive shop and wanted to know what I'd seen. And then my dive log would have as much, it would be a list of what I'd seen as, you know, all the, like the dive details as a traditional dive log. So I was always that kind of nerdy person in the, in the best sense of the word. Um, 
And um, what you're saying about being an expert, what, what I like about Sea Search is that we are basically a bunch of anoraks, again, in the best possible sense of the word, that we're all learning together. It's that sense of community. I'm firmly at the bottom of the Dunning-Kruger curve because I've learned just enough to know how little I know. And I actually think that's a brilliant place to be because it means I can always find something new to get excited about or to discover or whatever. I, I don't see it as a bad thing, <laughs> realising how little I know. So it's just it's just fascinating. I mean, and for me, now being able to make use of those records, so I haven't just got, you know, lots of treasures collected, that I can actually put names to it and I know that it's going somewhere. I know that sounds really worthy, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's important to me that the, what I'm doing is 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 actually having an effect um, and doing some good, if you like, as well as being, you know, massively engaging and filling my house full of slightly smelly things. <laughs> uh, brilliant. No, that's, I, I, I think that's, it sounds like there's a common thread, really, of that kind of development and learning and um, sort of, yeah, so, so self-development, I suppose, in, in, in doing citizen science. Um, that's, possibly, that's really possibly like, yeah. still being children. Possibly we're all we're all very connected with our inner child. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, certainly, certainly, well, certainly, why I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Jules, you've uh, you've said you, you'll answer this question from Dan in the Q and A. So um, Jules just asked about how the data is published and shared, and whether it's available to download um, alongside discovery metadata. Um, yeah, so uh, all the data you can see, it's all open access on the Big Sea Research website. So you can go there and you can look at all the records. Um, like I said, we've only had Sally working this summer on cleaning all the data. <laughs> it was a right old mess. So, um, yeah, we haven't um, published it yet. So it's in, um, we're writing papers at the moment. So there's going to be one on the results and one on what we've learned about doing big sea research as a citizen science project and um, we've done a couple of posters so yeah it should be published soon in terms yeah. of um data the natural history museum own the data like i said it's all there on the website but um i think we'll be looking at how we either transfer it to nbn or you know those kind of um uh, data sharing have to make it freely accessible but it but it is it is getting there <laughs> okay marcel um has asked um what are some good options to research seaweed and other marine life in dorset <laughs> and do a big seaweed search <laughs> yeah, <thank you. laughs> um charlotte obviously knows knows dorset very well do you uh any advice i'd we 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 do have um we've got a sea search seaweed guide seaweeds seaweeds are tricky because they don't photograph very well um in my experience um so quite often what you find on the shore um doesn't look anything like the photo in the book um and they can also be very very different in different conditions so the best thing to do is to find a fellow seaweed nerd who knows a bit more than you do and go out on the shore with them <laughs> is in my experience that's not totally helpful right now because of the covid restrictions but there are lots and lots of resources out there there's there's inat that susan uses there's facebook groups of people and um, they have specific seaweed um groups that you can join in and then you know you can put your photo up and explain where you saw it and and ask for some help in identification um with the usual sort of internet proviso of you know don't take the first answer you get necessarily um but no, plenty of resources out there. So just just find a community, find an online community and, and get out there. And then if you get it wrong, you'll have to go back and have another go. If you want to start off just with the 14 for the big seaweed search, that's kind of more doable. It narrows mm. it down and they're not all to species. So um, mm. there is a guide on the website that helps you. Um, so have a go and then, you know, you can always drop me an email and say, I found this. I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> so it's a good place to start I think because you're not really? trying to do all 650 species because that would just blow your mind yes <laughs> I mean what the way we can do recording of seaweeds with our sea search volunteers quite often we know that you can't identify things to species underwater and so you know we lack because we want to get that sort of habitat information as much 
as the the specific you know the species information you can just record it as fluffy red seaweeds and they can be a particular nightmare you know you look at how many books you need and you need a microscope and and you need an awful lot of time so as Jules says, start start with the big chunky ones that there are lots of that are much easier to do and kind of ease yourself into it. And if you decide that, you know, fluffy red seaweeds really are your thing, then that's something you can specialise in and, and that will be great. Yeah, that's that, that's good advice. Thank you. Um, like, so John Hepburn has asked, there's, there's been some chats on the NHM Facebook group about the accuracy of INAPS location data and IDs, but I record location data is just down to what the observer puts on the map, um, which isn't as easy as iNaturalist. And there are protocols to ensure accuracy of observations brought into the national database. So why isn't INAT more enthusiastically embraced by the UK data keepers? Well, the location data, if you're using a cell phone, your location data is coming from the GPS that's in your cell phone. And that I find sometimes it's inaccurate by maybe as much as a quarter of a mile. Mm. Sometimes when I'm on Randall's Island, it will record a location as being on the other side of the Harlem River, which isn't very helpful. So it's a good idea to scan through your observations and just look and see if the dot on the map is accurate. Some people use a separate GPS unit that might be more accurate than the one in their camera because I think it's by the one in their cell phone because I think it's sometimes influenced just by where the nearest cell towers are and that kind of thing. It doesn't triangulate properly. Mm. But in general, I think the locality data is quite good. The UK only just got its own iNaturalist chapter. It only just, what? a week or two ago, got its own separate identity that links up with the MBA and other major UK organisations. And I think it really helps a lot to have that slightly more, I'm, I'm not calling the UK local, but it's a, slightly, <laughs> it's a slightly more local focus than the whole of the world. So I think also the other reason INAT hasn't been embraced all that much is because you guys have been using alternative recording systems. So nobody's really tried it out and discovered how easy it is and how pleasant it is and how user-friendly it is in so many ways. That's, that's what I would guess. I'm not saying that iNaturalist is perfect, but for citizen scientists, it has, it's very simple, very straightforward and does have a lot of advantages, I think. Susan's right. I think in, in a lot of ways, um, the UK, Britain and Ireland, I mean, Sea Search has been around for 30 years. We've had, we have a sort of a history of recording or an infrastructure of recording that is quite well established and iNaturalist is kind of the, the new kid on the block and I think maybe it's just people going well I've got a system that works for me now um, and they, they said they you know just don't want to change I don't know I think yeah the, the, the features you know lots of the features are it's massively accessible absolutely um, I just know that you know for C search we already have our infrastructure and our data flow processes and you know it's we, we, we'll continue that with that we've got 30 years of data in it but I think anything that can make recording more accessible to people has got to be a good thing because you know observations that are just on a bit of paper on your desk don't do anybody any good really. Dan's put in the uh, in the Q&A as well that we the MBA are working with the NBN uh, National Biodiversity Network and BRC the Biological uh, Record Centre to um, who run iRecord um, on iNaturalist UK and that we're all committed now to promoting the iNaturalist platform. So I think that the, the, the big people that I think John was probably referring to um, probably are getting behind that iNaturalist now as, as another tool for collecting data. I think it's like you say, it's different different tools for different different jobs. And I think it sounds like iNaturalist is, is a good way of getting new people into recording these kind of ad hoc records that they wouldn't have 
recorded otherwise. So uh, Toby's just asked in the in the chat whether you can set up your own project in iNaturalist, Susan. I think the, well, the short Well, yes, answer. you can, although you can, anybody can in theory start a project, but we find that a lot of people who are brand new to iNaturalist immediately go on and try to start a project. And at that point, very often they don't really know what a project is or what it does or how to set it up or what the advantages and the disadvantages are. So it's if you're, you might be interested in making a project, but I'd always recommend that people get familiar <coughs> with iNaturalist first, make a bunch of observations, make a couple of hundred observations, do some identifications, learn your way around the site talk to other INAT people, get a little bit established and then think about a project because sometimes what you want to achieve, like if you wanted to find out what seaweed species are known from the New York City area, instead of getting a project to try to get people to put those observations into that project, you could use searches which would get you the same observations it would get you all the information that's already recorded almost instantly and you wouldn't need a project. So, I mean, projects are fine, but I would say don't let it be the first thing you do when you arrive on INAP. Yeah, that's good advice. That's time to end now. Um, so thank you very much, Charlotte, Jules and Susan for your very inspiring um, and informative talks. Uh, for joining us in the Q&A um, and thanks to everybody else for joining us and thanks for those particularly who've interacted um, asking questions and sharing your comments and your insights. For our next session um, which will be our uh, marine biology live session um, we are um, going to be uh, welcoming uh, some of the authors um, from the latest edition of the marine biologist magazine which explores the changing arctic ocean so it's a very exciting uh, theme session there and that's going to be on thursday the 20th of may